inspiriert gleichzeitig kollektive Vorstellungen darüber, wie wir als globale Gesellschaften miteinander leben und koexistieren wollen. Es war daher für mich eine Ehre, die Teilnehmenden dieses Austauschs kennenzulernen und gemeinsam mit ihnen zu erfahren, auf welche unterschiedliche Weise die Ethik unsere kollektive Erfahrung in und außerhalb von Museen prägt. Während der Veranstaltung heute Abend sind Sie, liebes Publikum, herzlich eingeladen, sich so weit wie möglich mit uns auszutauschen, entweder durch Fragen oder auch durch konstruktive und oder kritische Kommentare. Dazu können Sie das Vox Art Tool verwenden für diejenigen unter Ihnen, die das Tool noch nicht kennen. Keine Sorge, das ist ganz einfach. Klicken Sie einfach auf die URL, die Sie unten auf Ihrem Bildschirm sehen oder kopieren Sie sie. Sie können auch eine neue Registerkarte in Ihrem Webbrowser oder Ihr Handy nutzen. Eine weitere Möglichkeit ist der Zugriff über die Veranstaltungsseite auf der Website des Humboldt-Forums. Klicken Sie einfach auf An der Diskussion teilnehmen. Sobald Sie das Tool geöffnet haben, geben Sie Ihre Frage in das Textfeld ein und drücken die Eingabetaste. Nachdem Sie dann Ihre Frage eingereicht haben, sehen Sie alle Fragen, die auch von anderen eingereicht wurden und Sie können dann auch für Fragen abstimmen, die Ihnen am besten gefallen und die fünf besten Fragen werden uns dann gezeigt, eingespielt und ich werde sie den Diskussionsteilnehmenden stellen. So, damit hätten wir die Logistik geklärt und ich heiße Sie herzlich willkommen zu unserer heutigen Veranstaltung. Zunächst einmal wird Michael Dieminger ein paar Worte sagen. Er wird dann auch Dwayne Destro vorstellen, den Koordinator des Workshops. Vom Center for Curating the Archive an der University of Cape Town. Und ich danke natürlich ganz herzlich unserem Team, die das alles möglich gemacht haben damit wir hier zusammenkommen, damit wir sprechen können und damit wir auch in den vergangenen Monaten uns austauschen konnten. Michael Dieminger, wie gesagt, der Kurator von 99 Fragen, wird ein paar Worte zu Ihnen sprechen und dann geht's weiter. Ja, danke, Sammy. 99 Fragen ist ein Projekt, das wissen einige von Ihnen, glaube ich, schon, das über verschiedene Formate und Zugänge schauen will, wie über eine kuratorische und künstlerische Herangehensweise eine soziale Praxis im Museum zur Auseinandersetzung mit den kolonialen Auswirkungen in der Vergangenheit und Gegenwart möglich ist. In diesem Sinne ist 99 Fragen in erster Linie ein Raum, um Fragen zu stellen und Antworten zu hören, aber nicht um Antworten zu lehren. Wir wollen zuhören, um ansprechbar zu sein. Wir stellen Fragen zur Differenz, um Beziehungen und Vielfalt in den Formen der Epistemologien, des Wissens und des Verständnisses von zeitgenössischer Kunst und Konzepten des Kulturerbes zu schaffen. Aber eine kuratorische Praxis geht weit darüber hinaus. Sie hat auch eine Verantwortung für dringende soziale Fragen. Also es geht auch um gesellschaftlich, politisch relevante Aspekte. Da haben wir natürlich immer die Gefahr, dass es eine Universalisierung oder Bevormundung geben kann oder dass spezifische lokale Fragen und spezifische lokale Antworten und Zusammenhänge ausgeblendet werden. Die kuratorische Praxis kann aber diese Beziehungen sichtbar machen, um Emotionen, Wünsche und Verletzlichkeiten zu teilen. Museen sollten Orte sein, um sich gegenseitig zu inspirieren und voneinander zu lernen. Museen sollten Orte sein, an denen man von der Vielfalt lernen kann. Dies ist das zweite Jahr, in dem Duane Jethro und ich gemeinsam an der sogenannten School of Transnational Curatorship arbeiteten. Wir begannen mit der Idee einer Schule, um Raum für gegenseitiges Lernen zu schaffen und in in diesem Jahr haben wir uns mit Thais Mayumi, einer Kollegin vom Nationalmuseum von Rio de Janeiro, zusammengetan. Und gemeinsam mit Thais habe ich eine zweijährige Workshop-Reihe mit dem Titel Das Museum und sein eigener neuer Charakter durchgeführt. Die Idee dieses Workshops und des Dialogs war bzw. ist es, Räume für den Austausch zu schaffen, einen offenen Raum für Fragen. Diese Idee einer Schule soll ein Geflecht von Verbindungen herstellen, das offen ist und sich verändert, aber auch einen permanenten Austausch möglich macht. Bei der Idee der Schule geht es darum, 
über verschiedene Parameter zu sprechen. Es geht darum, verschiedene ethische Fragen und Formen der kuratorischen Gastfreundschaft zu erörtern. Diese sollen Raum finden. Auch das kuratorische Konzept der Gastfreundschaft gilt es kritisch zu hinterfragen. Denn auch Gastfreundschaft kann eine Manifestation von Macht sein, indem sie den Gastgebenden und den Gast definiert. Indem man sich die Position des Dauergastes aneignet, der geduldet, aber nicht akzeptiert wird beispielsweise. Wie kann sich ein Museum angesichts der kolonialen Bindungen als Ort der Gastfreundschaft definieren? Sind diese Objekte Gäste? In 99 Fragen wollen wir das Konzept der Gastfreundschaft als ein Werkzeug für Offenheit, für das Geben von Raum, das Teilen von Ressourcen und das Teilen von Wissen verwenden. Indem man Raum gibt, geht man Verpflichtungen ein, die sich im Austausch und in möglichen Antworten auf die Frage, wie man sich zueinander fällt, manifestieren. Ich hoffe, dass wir noch sehr, sehr viel mehr Austausch haben können, dass diese Form des Austauschs als wichtiges kuratorisches Instrument weiterleben kann. Ich freue mich jetzt, das Wort weiterzugeben an Dwayne Dressrow von der University of Art in Cape Town. Bitte schön. Thank you, Michael. Um, my name is Dwayne Jethro. Danke, Michael. Ich bin Dwayne Jethro. Ich bin Junior Research Fellow am Zentrum für das Kuratieren des Archivs an der Universität Kapstadt. Das Center for Curating. Die Archive arbeitet aktiv mit verschiedenen Arten von Sammlungen und entwickelt Kuratorinnentum als einen kreativen Ort des Wissens und der Wissensproduktion. Projekte, Publikationen, Kurse zielen darauf ab, durch die Praxis neuartige Kombinationen zwischen den historisch getrennten Bereichen der kreativen Künste und den wahrheitsbeanspruchenden Diskursen der Geschichte sowie der Sozial- und Natur. Wissenschaften zu eröffnen. Das vom CCA seit 2014 angebotene Honors in Curatorship Program wird in enger Zusammenarbeit mit dem ISICO Museum South Africa angeboten. Es bietet Kurse in Theorie und Praxis des Kuratierens an und entwickelt bei den Studierenden ein differenziertes Bewusstsein für die praktischen, politischen und poetischen Aspekte der Arbeit mit Sammlungen verschiedenster Art. Dieser Workshop und Vortrag baut auf einer Reihe kleinerer Workshops auf. Das hat ja Michael gerade auch schon geschildert, Workshops, die wir mit Michael Dieminger und KollegInnen zusammen durchgeführt haben, die sich mit der Frage von Einladungen und Partizipation beschäftigten, wobei die KuratorInnenklasse 2021 daran teilnahm und die über die Herausforderungen von Einladungen und über die Arbeit mit großen Kultur- und Kulturerbeinstitutionen diskutierten. Es war eine Einladung, diese Themen zu zu reflektieren, auch die ethischen Dilemma zu diskutieren. Dieses Jahr haben wir mit der Universität Rio de Janeiro ganz konkret zusammengearbeitet. Neue Museen, neue Ethik. Das Neue und das transnationale Ethische sind derzeit die beherrschenden Themen in der westlichen europäischen Museumswelt. Ausgehend von Debatten über die Geschichte europäischer Kolonialprojekte, über Besitzansprüche und Bedingungen von Objektsammlungen, die in Museen aufbewahrt werden und über die Restitution von Objekten und menschlichen Überresten haben diese Themen zunehmend an öffentliche Aufmerksamkeit gewonnen. Sie stehen im Zusammenhang mit wichtigen Texten, wichtigen Debatten, die sozusagen einen Ausgangspunkt darstellen für neue transnationale Kooperationen. But our discussion takes place on a different plane. Unsere Diskussion findet jedoch auf einer anderen Ebene und in einem anderen Register statt als die eben genannten für die Literatur, die ich eben ansprach, stehen Felvin Sarr, Benedict Savoy, Dan Hicks und andere. Wir fühlen uns vielmehr jetzt inspiriert von Janet Marsteins Vortrag 
und der anschließenden Diskussion mit Vandile Casibe und Macarena Gomez Baris, die in der Dialogreihe 99 Fragen, Praktiken und Prinzipien einer relationalen Ethik für Museen erörterten. Um unser Publikum zu erreichen, meiden wir also ein bisschen das Neue und verzichten darauf, Lösungen und Lösungsansätze vorzuschlagen. Das ist vielleicht auch eine Enttäuschung für unser Publikum, aber das Neue in Anführungszeichen ist eigentlich auch ein Konstrukt der Roadshow zur Restitutionsdebatte, eine Idee, ein Vorschlag für neue Wahrheiten, die uns aus diesen verwobenen, historisch verankerten, strukturellen Problemen herausführen können, die die Museen generiert haben. Leider ist dies keine Plattform für solche Einsichten, aber Sie werden in der Diskussion sehen, dass unsere Studierenden sich mit dringenderen und drängenderen lokalen ethischen Dilemma auseinanderzusetzen haben, wenn sie die Institution Museum in ihren vielfältigen Formen, in ihren jeweiligen lokalen Kontext verhandeln. Also das, was wir hier haben, ist nicht notwendigerweise verankert in der dominanten museologischen Diskussion. Manche werden vielleicht sagen, dass wir durch die Einbettung unseres Programms in das Humboldt-Forum und seine Programme schon ein ethisches Dilemma haben. Aber die Auseinandersetzung über Strukturwandel, Wandel, Restitution und We reject having our voices appropriated and co-opted and refuse the seduction of the new, but embrace the platform to triangulate a discussion between Germany, South Africa and Brazil, which in the workshop has been inspiring, informative and, and enriching. In what follows, we hope that you get a grasp of our, our respective emergent curatorial practice, our global South research contexts, and an on-the-ground perspective of the challenges new curators and muse museologists face in the day-to-day -day work. Now, I would like to introduce my colleague from Brazil, Amanda uh, Cavalcanti from the, from the Federal University of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Thank you so much. Thank you, Duane, for introducing our context and mentioning some questions that connect all of us. So since you did a very nice speech about it, I would like to, to mention more specifically the context of the Museology and Heritage Program that the Rio participants come from. Um, this is a program of UniRio, the Federal University of the States of Rio de Janeiro, in collaboration with MAST, the Museum of Astronomy and Related Sciences. And it is a high level professional training program that promotes master's and doctor degrees, focused on qualification of professionals for teaching, research, and innovation. Um, the course is dedicated to museologists and professionals from all areas of knowledge who work in museums and institutions dedicated to research, documentation, protection, and the diffusion of heritage. And it is a pioneering program in Brazil because it is the first master's and doctoral course in museology in South America. And talking a little about the current Brazilian context, It is important to mention that we are going through a moment in which the cultural area is politically undervalued in our country. So working with museums and other cultural institutions is hard. It's an act of love, of resistance. So in this challenging moment, being able to create connections with other students and professionals who are also passionate about what they do, willing to think about heritage, to think about museums and how to make them more social, uh, socially relevant spaces, inclusive, give us the strength to keep working for what we believe in together. So it was very exciting to collaborate with our colleagues from Cape Town and the ones from Berlin as well. 
And I hope today we can share with our audience the results of this partnership. Um, thank you. And now I give the mic back to Sammy. Thank you so much. Thank you both Dwayne and Amanda for setting a bit of the context, giving some insight into the programs the participants from both countries are coming from, and for also outlining some of the boundaries that our process took place in. Um, I thought that was very, very important and insightful. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, so moving on, the rest of the event tonight uh, will give you more insight into what this exchange looked like. First, we'd like to hear from both groups on some ethical dilemmas facing them in their current local context or country context. Um, and then we'll go into more of a dialogue between the two participants sharing some learnings and reflections on the process and what it can look like moving forward. Um, so yeah, as I said before, our exchange was took place over three internal workshops. And that's not so much time, but we were able to dive into what the realities are for both groups in our second session when we shared some ethical dilemmas with each other. And so to give some insight into that, I'd like to introduce two participants from each country that will present an ethical dilemma that is quite pressing for their context. Um, and we will start with the Rio group. So I'd like to welcome back Amanda, um, along with her colleague N Nilo Ameda, who will now present the context from Rio. Afterwards, there will be some questions. So floor is yours. Thank you, Sammy. Hello to everyone watching. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, so today we want to talk about the curator's job between being and being able to do and discuss what are the limits of action that curators face in museums and to bring dialogue and challenging relationships as part of the construction of the colonized narratives in museums. Next slide, please. Our starting point is a case that happened in MASP this year. The MASP, the Museu de Arte de São Paulo, as is Chateaubriand in English, São Paulo Art Museum, um, was conceived in the 1940s by the Brazilian entrepreneur uh, in the communication sector, Assis Chateaubriand, who invited the Italian art critic Pedro Maria Bardi to form the collection and manage the museum, and also Lina Bobardi to conceive the architecture and the exhibition design, which has become a landmark in the history of 20th century architecture and typography. And in the beginning, its collection was composed uh, largely of works of European and Brazilian art. But nowadays, there is a movement to include works of indigenous and African art made mainly by women artists. So MASP is holding currently consists of more than 11,000 artworks, including paintings, sculptures, objects, photographs, videos, pieces of clothing from various periods from Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. And it is considered one of the most important museums in Brazil and Latin America. Next slide, please. One of the main approaches recently proposed by the museum is to bring visibility to audience without visibility and to discuss the decolonial issue. The museum elaborated a new mission for the institution in 2017 that declared the MASP, is the MASP <laughs> uh, as a diverse, inclusive and plural museum. Um, for example, in 2018, the museum exhibited a retrospective of the Black Brazilian artist Maria Auxiliadora as a way of presenting the culture of the non-dominant classes in the museum through art. Uh, at the end of 2019, the anthropologist Sandra Benitez was invited to act as assistant curator of the institution, being the first indigenous curator to perform this role at the museum. 
there was this was largely communicated in the press, even on in the national media, as an important act to guarantee a more inclusive space. Next slide, please. Um, recently, the Brazilian media brought the museum back to spotlight to report that the exhibition Histórias Brasileiras, um, in English, Brazilian stories or Brazilian histories, in Portuguese, histórias can mean both, um, created by Sandra Benitez and others curators of MASP uh, that was scheduled to open in July 2022, uh, had sit six photographs selected by her as a curator that was not included in the exhibition by the museum. So unable to continue with the exhibition as they had planned, Sandra Benitez and Clarissa Diniz, another curator involved in the Retomadas, a curatorial access about social movements that prioritize recovering their rights, resigns from the institution. The museum says that the reason of not including the pictures was a bureaucratic one. Um, the time to request loans for the works on the pictures would not be sufficient. But since the pictures had a political and social aspect, we reflect on the impact of taking it off of the exhibition. The pictures represented the landless workers' movement, a movement that divides opinions in Brazil, seen by a part of the population as revolutionary and apart from the established order, and by the other parts of the population as a group with legitimate questions like the agrarian reform in Brazil. Next slide, please. So when we reflected on this recent case, it has brought to our mind some questions that help us think about the role of curators in museums and the challenges they face when exercising their activities, their power. One thing that our group discussed a lot was the power of museums. That is the theme of this year's International Museum Day by ICOM. And we discussed the power of curators as well. Uh, that in their activities, they can make important choices like what should be communicated, what should be silenced, that can directly affect other people. But at the same time, there are questions about the limits of a curator's performance, since this person is constantly just one within a set of different agents with different interests within an institution. And of course, we discussed about the internal structures that curators find in institutions and that often create barriers in their work, many times bureaucratic barriers that are difficult to overcome if you are acting alone. And the other topic we discussed was the urge of including different voices in curatorial processes. What is extremely relevant nowadays if you want to create the colonized narratives. But changing these power structures is very difficult because it often means giving up absolute power to allow the creation of more horizontal processes on the same eye level with others. So we remain with the question how to ensure multiple voices in a work with multiple curators and multiple interests. Milo, I'll give the mic to you. Milo, can you hear us? The mic is yours. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Are you listening fine? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a brief uh, welcome. So keeping the presentation, <laughs> uh, as Amanda was talking, uh, the next slide, please. It's a general questions that case of Oaks. What is the effective outcome of the curator and how to ensure multiple voices now work with multiple curators? Uh, when you think about uh, MASP as a, how can I say, big museum, we can use the same idea for all 
kinds and types and shapes of museums because you have uh, actually this uh, diversity of gender, uh, ethnicity, and how can you embrace and keep everybody talking together, mostly as curators. So uh, next slide. Uh, Uh, it's a do that. So it's a if you have the challenging relationships uh, as a center of. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's the one back, <laughs> slide back, please. Oh, thank you. Now, it's, if I can see the, the, it's not showing to me, sorry. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, the challenging relationships we, we have to face between society as curators with institutions and sponsors. So how can we do that? So the next slide is it's facing challenging relationships. Dialogue, strongest way we can uh, Face. So, uh, and how can we do that? First, reconciling interests or the interests of different agents must be presented with transparency from the very beginning because, depending on the institution, are you work or are you working with? What's the mission? Uh, how do they deal with some topics like the colonial topics, for example? Um, it's not a matter, but it's mostly based on not what we deal with that and how the institution deal with that and talk about it. Institutional culture, it's necessary to join forces to change internal barriers in the institutions. As I said, before uh, them has their own values and uh, beliefs. So always under so. Dialogical process take longer to implement, so the relationship may be created. This must be negotiated. Uh, so we must work with time, patience, and resilience. Working in a very everyday basis, talking, listening, being ready to uh, the acceptance, acceptance to the other's opinions, and. Uh, most of all, be open. It's important to implement measures to listen to different groups of the population, as well as implementing changes if necessary. So we must be able to uh, celebrate and uh, embrace the diversity of audiences and public in being able to talk about it with, if you think about it's a private institution with the board or a public institution with the uh, people who support or agencies who, who support institution, which is bringing everybody together. So the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Are you listening to me? Yes, we had some problem Hi. with connection, but now we can hear you. Ah, okay. Okay. So every curatorial decision is an ethical decision. So uh, I think most of all nowadays, uh, curators uh, must face not only their decisions uh, that's, which are important with the, the exhibitions and the co collections, but how these decisions affect them. Uh, the public uh, and audiences, and how can they be 
able to work as a, uh, a Exchange uh, use the, the, the dimension of a round table, uh, bring it ever Neil, I'm sorry, we're having problem with table, your connection. So, would you mind if I finish the presentation? Sure. Okay, so sorry, because I'm sure you had a lot to uh, discuss and to put in the, into the presentation, but since we are having problems, I'll just finish and mm -hmm. present that, yeah, we believe that dialogues on a round table, that, which means at the same eye level, with different agents that contribute in the institutions, uh, with that, we say also participants from the society and from different social groups that are all often marginalized from these curatorial processes is the best way for getting better scenarios in the future. And that's the finish of our presentation. <laughs> the last, next slide, please. Here you find the names of all the participants from the Rio group. And we thank you for your attention. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, so sorry about the technical internet difficulties, but that is what happens when we're doing online exchanges like this, a very normal process. We experienced it also in our exchange, of course, um, and I think it speaks also to what Nilo was saying about the time it takes to give to these sort of processes. You know, a lot of us had a lot of patience in making sure we could meet each other and talk. And that's something that's really important as we try to deal with some of these dilemmas that we're facing. Um, I want to check quickly the Vox R tool and remind all of the audience members and everyone watching that you're welcome to pose questions there, should you have any. Um, but maybe one question from my side for the two of you, um, these four steps that you mentioned about being open and having time, and now I didn't write down the other two, but um, where do those come from? Are those are those something that are standardized somewhere that are, are something that a lot of people are talking about implementing in some way, or can you say more about where those come from? Um, so it came from all the discussions we made in this, <laughs> the three sessions here, the reflections we were making, uh, making after the three sessions we have together, and also the reflections that this case in particular from MASPI um, evokes on us since the problem with time, when, when the institution says they have time uh, for the long requests and it wasn't um, the necessary to bring these works that was after um, put it aside, problems with the internal structures we find in institutions and these bureaucratic barriers. Um, the reflections on the difficulties we have on trying to hear people, hear the society in different um, social groups that we often don't hear, and also the problems we have when to, to how can I say, to put in practice everything we hear from them, because it's easier to hear. We know we have a lot, it's very challenging to hear, but to hear it's a little bit easier to, to implement what these social groups are asking us to do and what they want to see differently in our institutions. So yeah, we have to be open. And the first one I just forgot, I don't know if you <laughs> remember. Uh, I forgot, <laughs> but yeah, it comes from the discussions we made together and also from this particular case of mass people. Mm -hmm. For counseling interests. Oh, yeah. 
Ah, that's yeah. something that came from all the, the, the dilemmas we uh, discussed together in this 1989 question partnership. Always re, uh, considering and uh, reconciliating different interests is something very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think people think of it as difficult, but really it is the time and the effort that goes into it. Not that it's difficult in itself. I think, and and maybe that's a good way and learning for us to think about and frame it as we move forward, that it's not so difficult. It just takes more time and effort, which some people find difficult, maybe. (laughs) Yeah, and the the thing we put on the slide is transparency. Like, Mm -hmm. I think everyone that works together has to be very open about the, the, the interests as a person, as a professional, as an institution, uh, what are the interests that we put on the table? And yeah, with transparency, we can face it in a more um, dynamic way, I think. Amazing. Um, I have another question, but there will be time in the dialogue that follows to reflect more on these dilemmas as a whole. So I'll save it for that. Um, thank you both, Amanda and Nilo, for sharing this dilemma from the context of Brazil and and Rio. Um, So then we will move on also to our participants from South Africa. So now um, from the other side, please welcome Vani Beloi and Seth Krieger from the University of Cape Town. Um, Vani and Seth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sammy. Um, and hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Amanda and Nilo. Uh, it was a very fascinating ethical dilemma. And I think from our conversations, um, we definitely got to weave through the similarities uh, and differences when it comes to the locality of our um, dilemmas. Um, today, I will be uh, presenting on behalf of uh, our Cape Town colleagues um, and talking about the controversial collection. And once I'm done, um, my colleague Seth Krieger will be um, just reflecting a bit further on our dilemma. Um, so yes, uh, how should museums exhibit the problematic and violent? So a question that has stumped many critics, collectors and artists at large and myself at times is whether an artist can be separated from their body of work. Although complex arguments have arisen from this inquiry in recent times with the focus on gender-based violence, racism, xenophobia and patriarchy, um, activists and marginalized groups have highlighted the need for work of artists to be interrogated alongside the character and acts of the individual who created them. Um, Next slide, please. So the ethical dilemma that I would like to highlight is that of collections and specifically that of Ezekiel South African National Gallery located here in Cape Town, who have exhibited works by artists such as Weletu Mtetwa, who is convicted of murder of a sex worker, Nokupila Kumalo in Cape Town, South Africa, 2017. This inquiry will highlight the history of apartheid in South Africa that has led to collections that are problematic in their own right and how this has persisted in recent times with the scourge of gender-based violence. I'd also like to look into curatorial practices of museums like Ezekiel when dealing with controversial collections and whether there's any certain ways that works like these can be exhibited ethically and with practices of care in mind. Next slide, please. So popularly known as one of the most well-known figures in modernist art in South Africa, Irma Stern has rightfully shaped the identity of South African art, especially in the apartheid era. Her ethnographic and anthropological depictions of people of color across Africa was perceived as somewhat progressive and radical for her time. But with the dawn of democracy and the end of apartheid, art historians began to critically look at the individual alongside the art that individual creates. 
Stern, although proclaimed herself as apolitical at a time of violent segregation and oppression of people of color, was known to hold conservative values when it came to the realities of her country. However, this did not end with her personal life, as a large critique of her work is that she rarely ever named her sitting subjects of color, reducing them to either a region they presided or a defining characteristic within the painting. As one of the most collected South African artists in art history, it would be naive to think that her work should be relegated to musty archives and never shown. However, I do think that there tends to be a lack of acknowledgement in the problematics that exist concerning her work and her discriminatory outlook on racial tensions within South Africa and how galleries and museums approach exhibiting her work. An example of this is at the Novel Foundation in South Africa. They are currently showing a series um, of works created by Irma Stern during her travels of Zanzibar with a similar theme of detachment from her sitters, yet no acknowledgement from the curators of the problematics in this, despite a growing need to critically engage with colonial archives. I believe this to be an appropriate point of departure in discussing the aesthetics and ethics of dealing with collections such as Dwele Tum Tetwa in an age of violence, discrimination and marginalization. Next slide, please. Although apartheid, which saw the violent oppression of millions of Black South Africans, ended over two decades ago, the persistence of violence and racism specifically towards women of color still persists to this day. South Africa is known as the rape capital of the world, and one in three women experience gender-based violence in the country. In addition to this, another vulnerable group is the labor force of sports, who, similar to other countries in the world, is criminalized. This leaves them vulnerable to unlawful arrest, violence, and rape. With such a grim reality, advocacy and act activism for such marginalized groups becomes that much more critical, as lack of visibility of these issues allows the violence to pers persist. Next slide. So before delving into the ethical dilemma of Zoletu Mtetwa's collection of works within museums, I will give a short biography just to point to the large influence the artist had locally and internationally. Mtetwa was born in 1960 in the coastal city of Durban in South Africa. He studied fine arts here at Michaela School of Fine Arts before studying for his master's at the Rochester Technology of Arts in New York. His photography and paintings can be found in collections around the world, including Javits um, at the University of Pretoria and New Church Museum in Cape Town and the Scottish National Gallery. In 2013, Mtetwa brutally attacked 23-year-old sex worker Nokopila Kumalo, resulting in her untimely death. He was later convicted of the murder in 2016. The National Gallery exhibited work in 2016, the National Gallery exhibited works in the exhibition Our Lady. The exhibition's aims was to highlight the rampant epidemic of gender-based violence in South Africa, which made the inclusion of Mtetwa's works even more jarring. What is important to note was not the existence of these works, but the defense given by curators as to why they were exhibited. Curator Kirsty Cockerell explained that the inclusion of the works was to create dialogue surrounding these issues. However, the sentiments of advocacy groups such as Sweat seems apt as they remark that the exhibition showing the exhibition and showing of his works has in fact served to prioritize the notoriety of the accused rather than to respect the victim, and suggested replacing Mteto's works with a portrait of Kumalo, which you can see to your right, which in the end did occur. It can be understood that the inclusion of controversial works in museums could be a way to spark further conversation, as I do believe that spaces like museums lend themselves to be open spaces to question and unpack rather than purely safe spaces to protect and ignore. However, there, ha there has, been, has to be an ethical sensibility implemented when decisions such as these are made, especially in this case where the trial was in motion and the family and friends of the victim are still reeling from what has happened to their daughter, colleague and friend. 
Curators and museums as institutions have an obligation to the public to be cognizant of this and exhibit with practices of care in mind, so as not to sanitize history, but acknowledge the trauma and not just those who have committed said trauma. Creating dialogue does not begin and end with hanging a painting, but calls for museums to acknowledge the violence that persists in showing such collections and point to ways in which artworks like these add value to combating issues they have highlighted in what has been exhibited. Thank you. Um, and now I will be handing over to my colleague, uh, Seth Krieger, um, just for further reflection. Thank you, Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to kind of just be um, summing up and dealing with um, the prompts that were put forward within our um, ethical dilemma present or the ethical dilemma presentation that Bonnie put forward. Um, and I've kind of summarized it into a set of questions and provocations that kind of come from that. Um, so I think the first question that comes out within our dilemma is, um, can we separate art from the artist? Um, so alongside the noted examples of Ntetua, Irma Stern, um, I even conjure up this question against the, li the likes of Hitler's paintings. The question stands of how do we view art upon noting its relation to the artist? Um, so someone that has spoken about this is scholar Arnold Berliant, who dissects the dichotomy of perceived morality into two spheres of distinction. Um, the first being the moral status of art objects and the second being the artists themselves. Essentially, Berlant puts forward the rationale that art and artists are both included within the conversation of morality as they exist as a mutualistic relationship, a beholding of creator and creation. Essentially, this point then, um, just saying how um, they both hold, they both share weight um, within, I guess, where this dilemma stands. Okay, the next question that comes up is, is there an argument to be made for excluding histories? Um, so um, as Voni had mentioned about the work of Mtetwa um, being called to be removed from exhibitions um, due to his violent um, history and violent actions, um, it, it's essentially this question of, is that the way forward to exclude um, these works from um, the canon that they exist within. I think a very um, fine point that was brought up was the example of Irma Stern, who still manages to be um, the leading figurehead for South African art. Um, and I think within this conversation of when ex excluding, um, it's also then a question of where do we begin with that? Um, because as much as we can kind of seek to draw these lines now, um, how far back does one go? Um, especially, I bring this up, especially in relation to um, paintings that come from colonial um, and slave origins. Um, and I think this um, point or this conversation of drawing a line um, is one that Duane had actually mentioned much earlier, um, is that within, I guess, this larger conversation of ethical dilemma, um, it's not necessarily about drawing a line. Um, in our conversations um, with the Rio colleagues and with Sami, um, it came up that perhaps maybe not a line, but maybe a square or circle is another, um, something else that can be drawn. Um, as ethical dilemmas are not merely a state of good versus evil, that a line can actually be drawn between, but rather exist as relational models that um, just, yeah. So the last kind of question and provocation that comes up is, is there a way forward? Um, so essentially we're saying that, um, or essentially I'm asking is, is it not our purpose as curators or simply as individuals um, to promote a better future? We can't change the past as it has already happened, um, but through that, can one rewrite history? Um, as curators, we have the space and possibility where we can change the narratives of the past in ways where ethics are seen and instances of justice, care, and restoration are honored. Within drawing this line, we are not drawing a line between two sides, but then rather drawing a line pointing towards a better future. All right, thank you both for your input. Um, I was trying to figure out what that sound is in the back that keeps happening. 
Um, but it's storming outside. So oh, is that what it is? Uh, probably okay. it's the it's the rain. Okay, but I, I it didn't even sound like it was coming from you, and so I was just wondering, like someone unmuted or I don't know. Um, so as I said before, we're joining from so many places. Technical difficulties are bound to happen, but thank you both. That was. A great. Um, what I was thinking as you were speaking was something we reflected on in the exchange that after we heard some of these dilemmas during our second session, a lot of us felt like, OK, well, we need to let this sink in and digest all of this before we can, can talk about it. And so hearing it again and also yeah, having that space was really important. Um, you already answered some of the, or posed some of the questions that I was also thinking of. Uh, but there are, there is a question that maybe might fit from the Box Art Tool. And it says, how can institutions or should they be publicizing their decisions when facing ethical dilemmas? Um, and I wonder if you have a thought on that. Also in the context of Emma Stern, I wonder how often when she's talked about in public, it's equated with the problematics because I understood that that is a conversation on one side, but on the other side, she's championed for her work. How much is that a conversation together um, in the public in South Africa? To either of you. Um, would it be possible to answer the first question and then the Sure. Um, oh, fine. Okay. Um, I think in terms of, and as Amanda and Nilo were speaking, um, this idea of transparency, and I think institutions should have an, a, a sense of obligation in terms of publicizing and making known like um, what is behind the decision, um, especially when it is um, around sensitive issues, such as in the case of Zoeletu um, why, Tetwa, um, why hang the piece, why in that space and in what way, um, I think is important. Uh, yeah, so I do think there is a certain obligation for transparency. Um, and I think the public uh, kind of is does want that as well, um, just speaking on on my own behalf yeah mm -hmm. thank you Bonnie. yeah i think this question of transparency and publicness kind of come into um, both questions in some way um because as curators or mu museologists um you are upkeeping and presenting um one's archive or one's narrative or one's history um so there is this question of what um, narrative or what line or what argument are you essentially um, putting forward? So in the case of Irma Stern, for example, um, it's a center, it's only one side of this whole discussion that so often gets put forward um, and not necessarily the other one. And the other one kind of exists as this undercurrent of people critiquing her because she also is regarded in such a high um, viewpoint. Um, mm -hmm. So within this whole idea of publicness, if this whole conversation was made public or was transparent, you're then kind of able to put forward um, this artist in a way that people can then have the right to choose um, how they kind of want to view her. Maybe they don't see it as a problem. Maybe it isn't a problem that necessarily concerns them. But it's this idea of publicness in a way where you kind of then let the viewer um, or get, you give the space to the viewer for them to kind of discern where they kind of want to go. Um, and the, the exact same, um, I think, kind of sits with Ntetwa as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm thinking about that's how that's an ethical dilemma in itself of the line a curator would, would tread in order to make sure that what they're showing is unbiased in that sense, because in many cases you want to, there's like an educational aspect of curatorship, but there's also... Yeah, and they have their own biases, but then to present it in a way that allows the viewer to view it how they want to, then you don't have control over that anymore. It's an interesting dilemma to face. I'm not sure if we can bring Dwayne into the conversation. I see your hand in our chat, but technically I'm not sure we can do that. Um, but 
let me see if there's another question here on the tool. Okay, nothing specifically about the ethical dilemma, but one thing I think we also talked about was whose voices are being highlighted here, especially if the decision to show that artwork in that specific exhibition was supposed to be about violence against women and sex workers. Um, but then the art of someone who was violent in that regard was shown. Whose voice really does that show? Um, yeah, something you were talking about as well. Any other comments you'd like to share from your side, Seth and Moni? Um, uh, yeah, one thing from what you've just said, um, it is really interesting. And what I found even more interesting about Zueletu's Mteto's work that was shown was it was also an unnamed sitter. So even in the context of the, the exhibition and um, what they were trying to achieve, I still don't, it still doesn't connect um, with the particular image, even if we take Mteto out of the conversation. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both of you and also to Nilo and Amanda for the presentation just before. Um, so the next part we would like to share with you is a dialogue, more dialogue between participants in this exchange. Um, yeah, we would like to explore these dilemmas a little further, but also reflect on our process up until now. So to do that, I'd like to introduce a few other participants from the exchange. From the University of Cape Town Cur Curatorship Program, um, please welcome Kumo Mahano and Katlejo de Seco. Um, and from the Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro, please welcome Thais Mayumi, uh, who's co-coordinated the exchange on this side, and also again, Nilo Almeida. Um, welcome back to the event. Hello, all of you. <laughs> so, um, lots has been shared. Maybe you have some comments on the ethical dilemmas, but, yeah, before we get into that and some of the questions that have been posed um, on the Voxar tool, uh, one question I wanted to pose to you was about how our exchange was short and sweet, but there was lots of things that we were able to share with each other in our short time together. So I wonder if, if you all could share from the different groups some of the key learnings you had from the other side over the last month. Um, yeah, and please feel free to keep asking questions, everyone that's watching. Um, um, is it okay if I go first? Please. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so basically what I've learned um, from the Humboldt Forum workshops was, well, in the short space of time, um, was quite a bit. Um, so through the conversations with our Brazilian contemporaries, um, one of the things that stood out for me were how manifestos need to be more open to like revision in the sense that they now, as we know them, currently operate as like a, a list of strict directives instead of operating as um, a guidebook and, and as well as the, the necessity for digitization of um, manifestos. Um, yeah, and some other issues such as um, how I spoke both of both our Brazilian cohorts and um, Cape Town cohorts have issues that coalesce, such as um, dealing with historical collections from eras rooted in um, expansionism and things such as the ownership of artists' archives and how we can, I don't know, bring about change with regards to those issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kateko. Um, yeah, just to give some context to that, I mean, the idea of a manifesto was kind of one of the first 
concepts that we exchanged on because it some sort of a manifesto came out of earlier conversations that Michael and Dwayne were sharing about in the beginning. And so we kind of started there with what this manifesto says and what this manifesto could do. Um, and then you went on to also explore other types of manifestos, right? Um, Claire, who was the coordinator on the South African side also provided a lot of examples and, and went through those. And maybe, maybe Kumo, would you like to say a bit about, about that or maybe some of your learnings as well from the South African side? Um, yeah, um, over a short space of time that we got to interact with each other, I got to learn a lot and I just maybe wish that this um, friendship could grow from now until I don't know whenever, um, but I got to learn a lot about um, ethical dilemmas. For the most part, I think that's what, that's the point that stood out for me. I didn't understand Okay, I knew them, but I didn't understand how they fit into the context of being a curator and how do we as curators and museologists deal with them. And I, I, I think under a short space of time, I got to learn that it is okay to have this um, view of something, but also it's okay after some time to change your mind about it. That nah, that's it's not how I thought it was before. So, um, yeah, I think for the most part, I, 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 like the art world has a lot, has a lot of ethical dilemmas that I didn't know about. For instance, like the one that um, just mentioned by my colleagues, Zuelitin Tretua, I, I knew that his work was kind of problematic, but it kind of didn't dawn into me that it was that deep problematic. So... Um, I got to learn a lot and I just wish we could maybe continue to share ideas about ethical dilemmas in the future. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kumal. And from the Rio side, what are some of the main learnings you feel that you were inspired by during this process? Maybe I can start. Then Nelly can say more a few, uh, few more words after um, I, uh, I I think that it's uh, good that we are in this workshop called nine nine questions because the thing for me <laughs> it was that when facing ethical dilemmas we have most questions after they had been answers. So, um, and I, I realized that sometimes it's easier to discuss what we have to do than uh, actually doing it. Uh, that uh, on this process of creating, um, uh, we have to recognize that uh, curator uh, job, um, uh, it's a position of power, but not necessarily of controlling all the process. And for uh, facing this, uh, we have to recognize our limits, I think, because when we are discussing this and we were uh, facing uh, all these problems that we can uh, have when uh, discussing decolonization of museums, uh, when discussing um, uh, how to make museums more representative, we have have to recognize that uh, there are so many questions that we cannot answer all of them in uh, a curator process. So we first have to recognize our limits and probably uh, as uh, we, uh, our colleagues had already said today, um, had to be really uh, transparent to our public, to the society of what are the main issues that we are trying to face in this pro, pro in this process of creating an exhibition or a collection. And also, I think that it's important to uh, recognize the, the reality of each museum, because when we are discussing like the museums, uh, it 
seems like sometimes there is, okay, these institutions, museums, but uh, uh, um, reality, we are talking about so diff so many types of museums. They can be small, big, uh, local, um, um, can be controlled by a huge um, enterprise or not Funded at all can be a public or private institution. So here uh, uh, in Brazil, for example, we have some, of course, big museums like these uh, enormous museums that are very important to this construction of uh, Brazil's society and culture. But uh, I, I don't know. I think we have uh, almost four thousand. Uh, museums right now in Brazil, but most of them are younger than me, myself. So um, many, most of them are uh, uh, new ex new institutions. They are just starting to to realize what are their missions, what they are going to do, and many of them are already. Uh, doing process that are not related to a colonial process. So I think when we are um, making um, uh, demands to the museum as society, and also when we are museum workers are uh, responding to, to these questions in, or these demands from the society, we have to recognize and make this public. What kinds of institutions we are discussing and what can we do or not in our reality? Sometimes I think in all this discussion that we have this uh, last month, uh, I, I was thinking that we cannot embrace some, I don't know, hypocrisy when we are discussing ethical dilemmas because sometimes we can just go and, okay, just invite some people to make some dialogues and they say, okay, now I'm a decolonial museum and this is not, this is not true. You have to be sincere to, to the public and sometimes be sincere with what we can really do because sometimes you don't you have this few people working with you, we don't have money at all, and okay, you can just solve one problem this time, but so I, I will not lose track of what I have to do, but I have like these priorities, the things that I'm doing now, and maybe uh, having this utopia of what I can, I want to reach at the end, but uh, I cannot face everything at the same time. This it's for just summarize what I, we discussed, I think this Quite so, having so or facing so um, uh, uh, difficult or violence because the world is changing, some values are changing, and uh, the process of change sometimes have the battles or conflicts. It's natural. Maybe it could be more. Uh, Pacific or more with, based on dialogue, but it this, this is a process too. So I think the next day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Nilo. Um, yeah, you mentioned it as well, and Kumo did also earlier about the shifting of ethics, so shifting of situations and ethics, and I think that's something that came up often in um, our exchange together is how ethics are not static and um, questioning how and why they shift. Um, yeah, I think 
I'll come back to that in a moment, but there is a question that is being top rated on the Vox tool, so I must ask it. Um, and it is about hierarchies in museums. Um, as Nilo was just saying, I mean, this is a global issue, these conversations around society and decoloniality and questioning the status quo, I feel are happening in many, many different spaces in museums and as curators, that's, that's just one space that it's being questioned. So the question here is hierarchies in museums need to be broken so that other voices can be heard. Do you think this is possible? And if so, how can we do this? And maybe we don't have an answer to that necessarily, but um, maybe you can say a bit about these hierarchies that you're seeing um, that do need to be broken down so that more voices are heard. Would someone like to comment on that? Maybe not broken, maybe open. I like hmm. the word. <laughs> yes, because I think we must be more inclusive, more um, round table, eye level. I remember, I remember the manifesto that's a, it's an expression, eye level. So I remember when I talk to a child, what do you do? You down your knees in the eye level, the child is talked to it. So we need to do that in the... I think as curators, we are uh, we work with public, with museum staff, with the sponsors. If they are a public institution, and if they're public advisors or agencies, so talk to all of them. I think that's the only way. It's a, and it's a daily basis way, and the resilience process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I like that. I like that. Uh, not to break them, but to open them. Okay. Um, Kumo or Katlego, do you have any thoughts on hierarchies that you see? Yeah, Kumo, I see your hand. Um, I think adding on to what Nilo said, I think it's it's important to kind of open these hierarchical um, systems. But also it might be problematic in a sense that um, how do we then include the whole society maybe into deciding what goes into the museum and what doesn't goes in, go into the museum. And also on the other hand, it could also be um, the fact that when we, we as societies, when we see the exhibitions, we view them as the way we perceive them, not the way how the people that put them perceive them. Like for instance, um, the issue of sweat, that like the, the organization that protects um, the rights of sex workers in South Africa, when they wrote the letter to the curators for Zuele Tumte to Sweat, they um, responded by saying that um, the works act as evidence, but then the society does not know that that is an evidence. They only know, they, they only see the violations that is put in the, into the, into these exhibition um, spaces. So I don't know, it's kind of a problem, I could say. It's kind of a, an ongoing problem that um, if we build up these hierarchies, but it's it's necessary also it's not really necessary yeah mm. katlego do you have anything to add i'm yeah to add to that uh no not at the moment okay um but you did say something kumo that um that connects to another question maybe that's here and i think it was about um the shifting, oh no, now, now, now my train of thought has, has left me. Sorry about that. I'm sure it will come back. Um, but there is a question here for, um, well, I'm sure you can all talk about this, but it is a question from Rene Lomez, who's a professor of museology in, in Brazil. 
<laughs> the question is, is it really possible to decolonize museums with a focus only on exhibitions without radical changes in the processes and acquisition and documentation of items from museum collections? Any thoughts on this? Is it really possible? I, I think to it, sure, go ahead. No, I think if I think it's all connected. So uh, the exhibition is a part of the process from the communication of museums. So uh, it must change the way you see the collection first. So after that, how do you process the position, uh, the new uh, works or objects in the collection? And how will you look at your collection, what is, in, is already in the collection. So it's a, a, an ongoing process thinking about the researching in the museum, or the mm -hmm. back Oh, Nilo, I think we're missing, we're, so we're losing you. you can make a new exhibition or uh, a medical now approach. Sorry, Nilo, you were cutting out just a bit there. Um, but I heard that it's about the approach. And I think that is the question. Like, how much does the approach need to change um, rather than how we ultimately present this work? Because at that point, this whole process behind it has already been done. Um, Thais, Kumo, Katlego, any thoughts on this? I could add that uh, sometimes I, it's really nice this question because sometimes it's truly uh, what most uh, people, um, even from the society in general, expects that these uh, exhibitions there are the, the public face of the museum is the most important thing. And so this is important to listen to people to this uh, uh, process of making exhibitions. But uh, I totally agree with, with Nilo that doesn't make sense to face just the exhibition without the collections and the heritage that you are holding. So uh, sometimes it's good to, to, to take the exhibition process as an opportunity, I think, because you can use this opportunity to bring and to build the relations. I think uh, everything uh, goes around this because when you start and invite people to be, be part of exhibition and start to make, uh, uh, to build a, a relation with this group or these uh, representatives of uh, uh, a group, you can start a true and um, very valuable relation that can then uh, 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 help you and your institution to uh, review what you are document what is your in your object documents. Uh, for example, how when you are we are um, talking about information about collection, what kind of information do you keep? With, with it. Sometimes for the specialists or for the museum worker, uh, there are some things that are important that for uh, different groups of the society, other different kinds of uh, information are needed to, to make the, 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 exhibit, the, the, the objects or the, that heritage make sense, you know? So, so I think this is a great question because is something that you, we can uh, take as an opportunity to bring and to build uh, stronger relationships to the museum. Thank you. Um, I, I, that connects very well to another question that's here on the Vox tool. A couple of them actually. Um, so I'll try to ask them in, in combination with one another. But the first one says, comments on a, something that was said before that every curatorial decision is an ethical decision. 
the, the question and comment here says that that's a very powerful provocation. What does it say about a curator, or what a curator is and what a curator does? And we've commented a bit about that already. Um, so another question that's here is, is it about curators rewriting history or rather bringing affected communities and stakeholders into dialogue at various stages of decision-making? Any thoughts on this question? Is it about rewriting history as a curator or bringing these different groups in? That's the ethical decision. <laughs> That's the ethical decision itself. Kumo, yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's about bringing in other people to kind of um, deal with these issues because I don't think we as curators, we can only be, um, be given this role. It's a big role. We can, I don't think we cannot handle it as our own. I think we need to include other stakeholders that like ethical dilemmas, the people, what are the people saying? And yeah, pretty much that's that's what I think should happen. Nice. Thank you. I it also connects to a question I had planned before as well. Um, about whether your concept of a curator has shifted during this exchange. Like Maybe you came into the exchange or to your program um, with an idea of what a curator is. Could any of you share a bit about how that concept has shifted for you over the last month or through some of the things you've been discussing here? Um, well, what I've learned is that like um, there should be a push towards, well, as new creators, I think we should all push towards um, not looking at the community as just bystanders, you know, and, uh, or like involuntary participants and try to include them as much as possible. Cause I honestly believe that like the art is just as much ours as it is theirs. And yeah. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big learning, I think. And um, at least for me, engaging with museums has always been something that I go and, and see, not something that I was part of before. But if it's possible to shift that in some way, how powerful that could be. Um, any other thoughts on the shifting idea of curatorship from others? For me, uh, it was a great opportunity. I think these exchange in a self to self uh, collaboration and to hear uh, a little bit from the uh, museum field reality in uh, South Africa, because sometimes like this colonial process that all of us are uh, part of uh, makes us to uh, sometimes embrace some ethical dilemmas that are more related to uh, colonial countries that from our reality, from colonized countries. So uh, it's important to, to think about that and to reflect that uh, sometimes when it's uh, about our references, what kind of tests Texts, what kind of uh, museum workers, professionals that we uh, we know and we know the reality, we know the pro problems. Sometimes are all from North America or Europe, and this can also influ influence our decisions and our ways of thinking and to uh, facing these problems problems and sometimes facing problems that are not truly part of our reality. So it was really nice to have this opportunity to uh, rethink a little bit and try to uh, be more uh, aware of what are the, the main problems that we should face it and how to prioritize make priorities when uh, starting a process in a, in a curatorial level. Thank you, Thais. 
Um, Kumo, some thoughts on that? Um, I think the concept of being a curator, like over time, I got to learn that it's an ever evolving one. You don't get to grasp what what it really entails, because at one point you think that I'm just taking care of the museum collection, but then at some point you're like I'm dealing with ethical dilemmas. And then continuing forward, it's just like you're dealing with the public. You're trying to, um, I guess, liquidize the hierarchies that exist between um, these institutions. So it's just like, I don't know, every time when I think about it, I think about the concept of a curator, I come up with a new meaning to it. So there's no, I don't think there's really a tangible maybe definition of it, maybe Google has it, but as we discuss it further, it just gets more and more broader every minute. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that insight. I think that's important to think that it it doesn't need to be static, just like ethics are not. Um, At least that's what I've learned in my time with you all as well. Um, Katlego, did you still have a point? I saw your hand quickly. Um, no, I just felt like, um, I don't know, art institutions should make a bigger effort to think about like who their constituents truly are and if they're not being, and consider whether they're being, um, I guess myopic, you know, or if there's a bigger Mm -hmm. picture of, um, individuals they're not considering. And I also think being a curator just involves, um, operating with like a huge, um, sense of cultural sensitivity you know i don't think you can just walk in a room and pick out um that this goes there this goes there without considering um what the temperature is in the room you know and like um how important the information we're dealing with is yeah thank you thank you for that um so there's two more questions that i'd like to pose to you all Uh, before we come to a close. Um, And I remembered what I wanted to ask about what Kumo was saying before. It was about the relationship of museums to society. And when I was originally asked to join this process with you, the working title was uh, Museums and Society, questioning how connected those two were. And ultimately that is is what's come out in our conversations as well. But in thinking of who is the driving force behind change in museums, that was one of the the starting questions we had. Does it come from museums or does it come from a critical society? And especially thinking about the more mainstream topics of restitution and whatnot, um, a lot of that has come out through a critical society. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, so one of the questions here on the Vox tool is, Can museums, a type of cultural institution developed in the heydays of colonialism, be changed from the inside? Or does it need new forms of institutions not structurally afflicted by coloniality or I guess critical society as well? What are your thoughts on that? How can a museum be changed? Can it be changed from the inside? For me, the answer I think is movement from yes. both sides, <laughs> from inside and from the outside. Mm-hmm. From both sides. I mean, I guess that's an interesting question to pose to a group of people who work in museums, right? So obviously, it can if you're willing to be here questioning what. Yeah. The mainstream, uh, yeah. I think we have to believe in change. Because if not, what's the point of, uh, in, in everything that we are doing, you know? Uh, but I also believe that we have to support and help uh, maybe other kinds of uh, institutions that raise from this kind of process and moments in history, you know? Because it's sure that we can learn a lot from different kind of 
kinds of structure or institutions and process related to heritage, memory, and culture. And so I think that we have to, to have both. I, I believe in museum diversity. I think that having uh, different kinds of institution is the best for us because we can learn a lot from uh, institutions that uh, are uh, constructed and uh, raised in different kinds of contexts. And I think this is a good way or a path to follow to change these older and more traditional structures. Thanks, Thais. Um, any additions from the Cape Town side? Yeah, Kumo. Um, I think the idea of changing museums, I mean, museums, I think from my side, I view them, they, they always have some colonial um, history attached to them. I don't know if it's just me, but um, oftentimes when you hear the word museum, you're just thinking about the Asian art and all the art that you cannot find in the contemporary art world. But um I believe we can be able to change them, provided that they start changing within them. Like if we change the, the rules, if we change how we view them. Um, yeah, I feel like there is like a space for change, but that change is not, it's just more so or less like the, the concept of decolonization. It's not, it's not like an overnight change. It's like a process. So we, we cannot just, wake up and say, no, we have a new museum and we have a new way of viewing museums. So I feel like um, by also including these ethical dilemmas into the museum spaces, then we can, we are gradually moving towards changing the idea of museums. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Katleko. Um, just to add on to what uh, Kumo said, I think um, I think change can come from inside and outside, but I think um, if you're operating from the inside just as an institution, I think there needs to be like a brutal honesty about your shortcomings as well as um, what like the people who invested in your organization or institution, what, what are their needs? What's, what are their interests, you know? what really drives them to do what they do and does it really relate to what the people are looking to or the changes that people are looking to see that is a very good point and very nicely connected to the last question i'd like to pose to you all um it was also asked here in the tool and connects to a lot of what we've talked about which is that curatorship must involve society. Museums must involve society. They must be places that reflect the desires and perspectives that are present in our various societies. So what are the elements or practices of this round table idea that was proposed before? Um, and also toward relational ethics that both of these groups have spoken about. And do you think that they can be transported across contexts um, or are they very much context specific? So again, what are the elements of these sort of roundtables and bringing people together to achieve some of the things we've been talking about? Um, and can they be trans transnational in that sense or, or trans contextual? And I guess I would give it to Rio first and then to, and then to Cape Town. Any thoughts on this? Uh, there was something that I realized that it's a, like almost a global problem. Uh, that is these uh, labor relations in the museums because uh, sometimes uh, uh, we discuss it about how can people inside the museums uh, or collaborators to the museums can uh, say what they think and try to uh, build change without being fear. 
uh, having fear because if you are you have like a, a work relation with this institution and the depending on how this relation is, uh, you can uh, you, you need that job and sometimes you don't want to make some troubles because you don't want to lose that job. And so I realized in our exchange, this is a big issue, uh, uh, that we have to face this. We have to face that uh, sometimes uh, in our system, the, the labor relations are not fair to everyone. So... Uh, how these institutions that have these like these structures that sometimes people have temporary jobs they are just collaborating and how they can uh, they are just hired for uh, um, work uh, for a period of time and how we, we can guarantee that they are free to to uh, Put their uh, expressions and what in the, their thoughts and to um, be part of a real change if they have this, uh, uh, I don't know, weak relation like labor relation. So uh, I realized this is a big thing and they're uh, here in Brazil, but also in, in South Africa and, and probably everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the ability to do long term change if your contract is only temporary and you're brought in for a specific project. Thank you, Thais. Nilo, anything to add to that from the Rio context? I think the curator is a researcher. So uh, when you say, when you think about the round table, it's uh, what you can talk about in the round table. Even uh, if the, how can you deal with the collection, with your peers? How can you deal with the community about the collection or the exhibition? Uh, I was remembering now the historical museum in Rio. They they have a long term exhibition, and they add. Uh, some new objects and they're reviewing with, uh, I'm not mistaken, indigenous people. And they invite them to talk about the exhibition and review the exhibition. So that's, uh, for example, a, a kind of round table practice. So it's, uh, uh, it's I think the challenge for the curator is how can you are able inside the institution, even if it's a long-term uh, uh, work or a, a specific work, how can you uh, make this practice? Mm. How, how, how much space do you have to do that? Thank you. And Kumo and Kefego, any thoughts from your side on how a round table like this could be set up or what elements of it are necessary? Um, I think for me, it's about relational engagement more so because um, I feel like maybe adding on to what Nilo said, like um, engagement of just maybe not one subject matter into these issues, but maybe including other stakeholders, if I could call them that, um, into kind of discussing these issues beforehand, before like maybe exhibitions that are problematic or any of that, because um, I feel like it's important to kind of maybe include the society in as much as we don't want to do that. I think it's important to do that because um, the way we as academics view these issues, it's not the same as another person from the society can be able to, I don't know, view them or perceive them. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's important also adding on to um, opening up the hierarchical standards within um, museums and um, galleries. Thank you. Thank you, Kumo. Anything you'd like to add, Katlego? Um, well, I think roundtables at some level, um, 
can be guilty of uh, pandering, but I do think um, there needs to be an interest in um, who is taking part in them. Like, um, and I don't think um, they should exclusively consider the academic community and um, just allow for a broader perspective. I think um, other people should be considered as well. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can only relate from my context of um, community building and environmental policy and intersectional organizing, which again is, it takes a lot of time, as we were saying before, time, and genuine relationships and actually going out and yeah, being in places instead of inviting people into a space you've already created. We can talk about it for a very long time, but I think a lot of these learnings on how decoloniality is, is practiced in different sectors, whether it be in the curation of exhibitions and at museums or in the development of environmental justice in initiatives, I think it always takes this element of time and relationship building so that all of these different perspectives can be included and that the mainstream status quo can be challenged. So I thank you all for your, your insights onto this. Um, Kumo, Katrejo, Thais, Nilo, thank you so much. Um, also to all of the other participants of the exchange, um, again, it's been my pleasure to meet you all and be part of this process with you. Um, and yeah, so we, we thank everyone for being here and, and listening to what has come out of this wonderful exchange. Uh, that's all we have for the evening. Um, and a big thank you again to all the participants, to the coordinators of the exchange, Duane and Claire from Cape Town, Thais and Paolo from Rio, um, Michael for initiating also again, our tech team behind all of this, making it run smoothly. Thank you so much. Um, this also wrapped up the first round of 99 questions for this year. So we'll be taking a short summer break and be back soon with more very intriguing, interesting dialogue. So stay tuned. Um, but for now, thank you again for joining and have a beautiful evening. Um, we'll see you here again soon.